Ugh. <sighs> Mm-hmm. <laughs>
去，别来这一会儿去
Hey, Hangzi. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. How do I get on to the EC10 thing, which is starts, which will start at 10 a.m.? Yeah, yeah. We just we have like 25 minutes left. I know, I know. But uh, how do I get there? Because it was uh, when I directly clicked on the other, uh, what the other link for. Uh, gather town it asked me for a password uh oh you use the link a uh, zoom link and uh, just log in directly instead of like logging the gather town and do the... okay so this link is good yeah this link is good but if you want to do in the through the gather town we have no, i don't need gather town this is okay good. so let me see if i have access to share screen just a second so uh uh, okay, so all my uh, the other two speakers in my group, uh, they also can join in using this Zoom link, right? Yeah, can you use this Zoom link or okay. use the other time? It doesn't matter. No, this is good. Mm -hmm. How many people have registered for this uh, EC10? Uh, know? I'm not sure. Like, based on my understanding, they can, there are one, two, three, four, four. There are five people in this room, but I'm not sure they will all log in this room directly. So mm -hmm. maybe we'll have two or three or four. Yeah. Okay, that's very, that's okay. good. Okay. If nobody is there, we can chat with each other, the three of us. <laughs> uh, yeah. Now it's just... mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. So then I will uh, 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 log in at 9.55. I'll log out and come, right? Okay, thank you. Or 950 something. Mm -hmm. yeah. Let me do one more thing. Let me share my screen. Yes, I can yeah. see that. Yeah. Which one are you seeing? Uh the HLS for security. Yeah, I can't see that. Okay, maybe mm -hmm. I know. Uh let me uh let me stop sharing. Let me do something. Uh, HLS for security is what you'll see, right? And then I say presenter view. That's good. Then I go here. Sorry, let me go to Zoom. And I'll say share screen. And this one, and I'll say share. 
So now you see my first slide, right? Which says yeah. ESP 2022, talk easy 10 high level approaches to hardware security, with, right? Yes. Good, okay. yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Bye. Mm -hmm. I'll stop sharing. See you there. Mm -hmm. And I'll also leave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Morning, Ramesh. Hey, morning. You're muted, Ramesh, if you're talking. What do I do with my background? I should actually log into Zoom, right? And why use Zoom and then I... Well, you've probably got it already. Is this not open in Zoom? No, no, I'm saying... No, I can log out. And if I log into NYU Zoom with my background selected, then... Yeah. But this background is okay too, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is. You can always tell it to just blur your background as well if you want to try a different background. Okay. Let me. Start Are you in a hotel room? Yeah, I'm in a hotel room in College of in Virginia. Um, you've got the sun on that curtain straight into the cameras. Uh, if you tilt the laptop just a little bit to the right. Oh, no, 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 yeah. that the other way. No, I know, I know. I'll yeah. shut the thing because this is. Uh, yeah. yeah, that's better. Yeah, it's better. And uh, you need that's better too. There's some light, right? And where do I blur it? Okay, uh, so if you but in the bottom left where it says stop video, there should be a little arrow. Click that, and then there should be a button that says blur my background. Oh, you can even choose virtual background, but uh, choose video filter blur. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, so that's even that's yes. Good. So now it's, so, now you're now you're very professional. Yeah. Uh, what else? Uh, you want to share? Your, so you saw. Let, let me share my screen so you can see what I have. Hmm. Yeah, maybe I logged out of that. Uh, ESV catch up. Us. Okay. Uh, let me. There is my slide. Okay. Anyway, let me share later. First, let me uh, zoom. Let me share. Stop share. Okay, let me close a lot of these windows. Yeah. 
Hey. Good morning, Ramesh. Hey. You guys reached here fine. Hmm? You guys reached here fine. Yeah, yeah. We came in last night and so we just logged into Zoom. So make sure. No, I was just joking, but yeah. Anyway. Uh, uh, how's everything with you? You are calling in from Arizona or are you in wherever? Where is ESV? Is it all virtual? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's uh, hard to travel to Shanghai. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so... Yeah. Yeah. So it is necessarily hybrid. Mm -hmm. So not many. Oh, yeah, I know because of all the kid crazy, whatever the COVID. Uh, yes. Policies and so on, which makes yeah. sense. I think slowly, I'm slowly closing a lot of my windows. So uh, HLS, virtual integration. That's good. Okay. I think you guys are in good hands. Yeah, yeah. So we need uh, Hammond. Where is, uh, the Hammond is my um, postdoc, uh, research assistant professor, uh, and uh, where is uh, uh, he is also. Ben should be joining shortly. Yeah. So Hammond is known for his work in uh, large language models, which is an emerging. Uh, ML-based techniques. He got the best paper award at uh, this year's uh, IEEE Security and Privacy, the top security conference. Nice. And uh, he has one more next year coming on and a bunch of other papers that he's rolling out. He's a PhD from uh, University of Auckland, uh, New Zealand. So, so beautiful. I don't know if uh, Hammond is interested in... Uh, uh, so, so he's on the job market. I don't know if you have, uh, you guys have openings, but he's already has a couple of uh, offers. One he rejected, one he's considering, and but he's still looking for places that he's interested. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, just a quick. Uh, Aviral is from uh, ASU, right? Yes. As Arizona State University. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I've heard. Yeah. Yeah, no, I'll let you go. I don't want to take over. <laughs> uh, yeah, Hammond, have you applied to AC? Uh, I haven't got it in my uh, list of things that I've applied to yet, so I don't think so, no. Do, have you got positions open? I'm sure. I mean, okay, I'll actually. have a look. Yeah, and we have a very good security team, actually. Mm -hmm. is, they are very active, and they are very, very well-funded. So, yeah, I'll, um, I'll definitely take a look. Yeah, I think it would be awesome. And we have a very good AI team as well. I mean, right now, people working in large language models, exactly. But uh, I don't know who's working on security aspects of large language models. So you may be a very good fit. Mm. Yeah, it's uh, not that many of us yet, I would say. Oh, J Jeff is there, I think, right? So that student, Jeff Zhang? Yes, there? he just joined uh, ECE. Uh, yeah, he don't join DC, but uh, there, there might be. I I remember um, some we had some meeting with some uh, Adam Dupi and others yeah. on yeah. some of these meetings. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so uh, Hammond, go take a look at those things in case you are interested. And yeah, I will do. You are interested, and so yeah, cool. Okay, good Thank luck. You. Hammond, can you ping Ben? I just pinged him. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Ben is also a former postdoc who is at University of Calgary now. Okay. And uh, again, he's from uh, Auckland as well. So we have a nice pipe. This is part, these are all, uh, I think, so, at least Hammond is a, a Partha student. You know Partha? Yeah, ben, yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. <laughs> yeah. Whereas Ben is somebody else's student, but yeah, he's Partha Roop's student. Yeah, I'm, I'm Partha Roop. Um, ben was um, Morteza Buglari Apari student. I see. I yeah. see. Yeah, so minor, tiny, small world, right? Yeah, small world. <laughs> oh, cool. Okay, then. Okay, okay. Thank you. Yeah. So, how many you want to share me, share your slides or so with me? Yeah, let me just. Uh, just, I mean, not for, for correction, but just to see, make sure. Oh, I, I, I did email you to add you to them. No, no, not that. Just to share so that it is. Uh, oh, you want to just make just, sure that it's if working? You able to, if you are able to share, that's all. Yeah, okay, so let's go. Uh, da, 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 da. The link, the log there, coming. Ben said yeah. he's coming. So, you, so you should be able to see that. 
Yes, that's good. Yeah. Now let me share my screen. If okay, so I've sharing. stopped sharing. Uh, now let me go and uh, uh, say what should I do? HLS for security. Uh, okay. Hmm. Now I do slideshow. Yeah. Now I go to access. Then I go to Zoom link. And share screen. Come on. Share. You see that, right? Yep, I can see that. If That's you go full screen. Um, is it full screen? Uh, it's almost full screen. You've still got the browser bar at the top, but you can make that go full screen by um, pressing, what do you press? Probably like F10 on your keyboard. Or F3. This uh, okay, it's not F10. Okay, uh, what happened? Uh, oh, Ben's got Max. Yeah. So, uh, ben. Hey folks. Hi hey, Ben. Do you know how to maximize this so that there's no address bar in um, Ramesh's presentation? Um, are you using Safari or is this Firefox? It's Firefox, isn't it? No, I'm Safari. Oh, Safari? Um, sorry. I'm at Chrome, but yes, Safari. Let me quickly check. Because um, you have a Mac. I don't know how Macs work. Yeah, it should you should just be able to press the big green thing on the top left. The, mm -hmm. On the top left. Yeah. And then move your mouse down. Yeah. Right click on this. That still uh, has the address bar. Oh. Well, I think maybe because you've got all the other tabs open. What if you close the other tabs or put yeah. this into a new window? Close the, your email as well. You click, yeah, close your email tab, Ramesh. Yeah, let me try that. Okay. Yeah, I did that. Yeah. Okay, yeah, there you go. Now, so now, 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 go, now go present. The, the slideshow button, yeah. Slideshow. No, it okay, happen. yeah, but now you have to share that screen that the presenter view has popped out on. Currently, we're seeing your slideshow view. I know. I know. Let me uh, stop sharing. Let me restart. Yeah. Uh, for that, I have to go to the. You see, I have too many windows open. Let me see what open. Yeah. Uh, slide. So we have time, right? Slideshow, yeah. presenter view. Okay. Uh, then okay. Let me clean up everything. Nine fifty one. Still have, yeah. Want to keep this minimal? Then you can share your screen in the meantime. Just uh, yeah, I'm just getting set up on my iPad here. So yeah. Are you are just... the iPad guy. Yep. Yeah, that's good. I was, I so the order is uh, just to double check. The order is Ramesh and then me and then Ben. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah, if you want to do it the other way, it's okay. With me. No, that works. Yeah, right. all everything's kind of sufficiently self-contained. So I know. So it, these are all. So let me share my screen. Then I seem to be ready. Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, how about now? Close your emails again. Hmm? Close the emails on the other tab. Okay. Yeah. Now put your mouse back over the thing. Hmm? Here? Yeah. 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 Now hit that one. Enter full screen. There we go. Now bring your mouse down. Okay. No, it didn't work. Uh, Whatever. It's close enough. Can you yeah. see your notes still? Hmm? Can you see your notes when you do that? No. That's okay, the, yeah, so that's because it's the enter full screen. So if do everything other than enter full screen, and then you can probably still see your notes when you go yeah, to Yeah, exactly. So yeah. I just want to... 
okay yeah that's fine so that's all right but yeah if you don't have the other tabs at least it's not very tall because if i oh no in zoom you could actually pick up specific uh why is it not no so if you scroll up to the top um and on view can you see do you have the view menu for um safari so in this window or whichever window you're presenting for not that one the safari view There's something like always show toolbar and full screen, which I think you can. No, but uh, Ramesh, if he goes full screen, he won't be able to see his notes, right? That's the whole no. thing. Is he's got no, a slide. No, no, in the no, background. that is not the case. For you. Again, I don't know what I did the last time. I was able to go full screen, and the full screen shows up on your side, whereas I see everything. I could do that. But yeah, that's okay. I think the way I have it is okay too, even if the bar is there, right? It, because I don't have too much text for now. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So we have six minutes. Cool. Yeah. Because at this point, I don't want to do too much more. Yeah. Okay, that's good. I'll uh, open it. And maybe I should set it up so by the time people come, it should be okay. No. Yeah, I mean you can have it open to your your opening yeah. screen unless there's an ES week kind of welcome. Please wait. Yeah, maybe let's wait for a couple of minutes. But it's just the three of us for now. If no, we have some. For a... We have some folks with us. I see. Uh, How many do we? Yeah, two others. Lars is here. Hi, uh, Lars. How are you doing? Hey, Lars. Welcome. Mm -hmm. oh. Maybe he wanted to catch us for the seesaw stuff, Lars. <laughs> <laughs> Best place to get hold of us. <laughs> get a hold of you. <laughs> okay, this is Nectarius, a student. Yeah. Uh, the lead. Right? Yeah. Yeah. I met you uh, before him and when he came to lecture last semester. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She tells it's going good. We're going to release another set of challenges, probably at the first half of them. So, how is CISA coming along? So, you have enough uh, teams to bring them to campus or whatever? Yeah. I think we have three teams for the US. Okay. Not, it's okay. That's good. Um, okay. And uh, yeah, at least the first set of challenges last week, and then and, uh, at least the second set this. He was saying five or four or something like that. What happened? No, or oh, this was the total. Uh no, total to be like ten. No, oh, that's um, not so. Yeah. Maybe I'll, and what new U.S. had uh, India had more, right? Yeah, India had five or six or five. How many in uh, Europe? So, so I have to go check the number of teams. Yeah. But India had a good amount. It, it was like between five and seven. And then Europe had probably closer to five, I think. Okay, that's good. Double check. So it's always struggle at the end. Yeah, it was yeah. a little less on the US. Usually we have a few more, right? Eight or nine at least. Um last year or the year. There's like five. I think maybe we'll get more oh, in the past. Like in person. Yeah. In the past. At some point, it was when it was virtual, probably it predates you. It was uh, many more like a 10 or 12. But yeah. Cool. Yeah.
Now you can see the screen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we'll wait for a couple. So, so we have. So, should we start? Uh, yeah, you can start at any time you want. Because yeah, I'm just checking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Yeah, I will um, mute myself. Um, yeah. did, but just before we start, did you want to make any announcements in Gather Town if you haven't already? I don't know if you have. Uh, they are they're already in the Gather Town. So okay, cool. Okay, yeah. So maybe before. Uh, I start. You can see me, I guess, uh, wherever I am. Uh, yeah. So I think we have three speakers today. Uh, I am Kari Ramesh. Uh, I'm a professor of electrical and computer engineering at NYU uh, in New York. And I co-chair the NYU Center for Cybersecurity. Hammond, you want to go? Or Ben? Yeah. Hi, uh, my name's Hammond. I'm a research assistant professor here at NYU Tandon. Um, I um, have a research area that focuses on embedded cybersecurity, as well as also in um, AI cybersecurity implications, especially in things like large language models. Hi, everyone. My name is Benjamin Tan. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Calgary in Alberta, Canada. Um, and I lead the Calgary Integrated, uh, sorry, uh, Calgary Intelligence Secure Hardware Research Group. Um, my research interests are in um, hardware security generally these days, especially in the ideas around detecting hardware security bugs and patching of hardware security issues out in the field. Um, and it's uh, wonderful to have you all here. Yeah. So since uh, uh, thanks all, uh, since it's a small uh cozy group of uh participants here so interrupt interrupt us as and when you can this uh ec10 whatever i don't know ec stands for uh is it education course education or class education class number 10 uh the type it's on hardware security and i will uh, spend about 40 minutes don't worry about uh, so uh, and we we can either complete all the go through all the slides or not even go through the slides please do interrupt us um, and then hammond pierce dr hammond pierce will talk about security of testing uh, I, I think if that's the right order. and then dr ben tan uh, will talk about even more exciting stuff cwes so all of these are state of the art uh, uh, topics with some hands-on exercises. The second two will be even more hands-on. The first one still have, will have some interactive discussions and so on. So that's how we structured this presentation. Uh, so before, uh, any questions before I start from the collab, uh, from the, from those on the lecture? So you can raise hands I, uh, and, uh, either Hammond or Ben can monitor if I cannot. Yeah, I see a question, some chat thing that happened. That's me. Oh, okay, good. Feel free to put comments and questions. Yeah, that's good. Thanks, Hammond. Uh, so I just want to uh, thank you all. And I also want to thank the conference organizers for inviting us. Um, uh, 
so what we at NYU are looking at, and uh, this is uh, one of the very few groups, uh, uh, leading groups in hardware, uh, in cybersecurity in general, uh, we look at uh, the emerging world of internet of everything, wherein the basic trust in society is uh, at stake. And we're trying to impact uh, this general area in three ways. Um, uh, first, by uh, building secure systems at scale to make them unhackable, uh, a tall order though. Uh, we consider systems uh, across the stack, all over. The, uh, we consider systems at the hardware level, at the software level, and at the embedded systems level. And we look at them holistically and we deploy them at neighborhood scale, city scale, and even global scale. So, so, so we're looking at uh, large scale systems. Uh, we are securing, uh, and that's this is the focus here too, securing important supply chains, electronics, software, control systems, and manufacturing. Um, finally, we are, our team at NYU looks at other interesting topics such as fighting cyber crimes at global scale, including financial cyber crimes and cyber crimes against uh, children. So uh, let me see, how do I go to my next slide? Yeah, so this is the mission for the Center for Cybersecurity. And this is the only slide I, I will have, at, which is at a higher level, research to secure the cyber infrastructure, as I pointed out, to educate the next generation of cybersecurity professionals and to shape public discourse on the policy and legal aspects. It's an interdisciplinary center, spans multiple schools, multiple campuses, and so on and so forth. Uh, so I wanted to quickly jump to the learning objectives of this particular presentation. Uh, what, or this part of the presentation, what I want to do is to show that high level, is a promising level to design security accelerators and or any accelerators. And I'll spend a, not too much time on that topic of it, not that part of it. Then we want to, I want to spend a lot more time to show that high level is a promising level to design in security. For example, I'll give you, uh, we'll go over how high level uh, this synthesis uh, can be used for Trojan detection. I'll show how uh, we'll discuss how high level synthesis can be used for seamless and meaningful design obfuscation beside other besides other things. So there are many more things uh, that you can use uh, high level uh, operate at high level, both for design and both for attack and the attack of systems. So I just want to the key takeaway is that high level besides uh, in addition to logic level and uh, physical layout level, high level is an important uh, level at which to operate on both in terms of for cybersecurity uh, in, in the context of hardware acceleration and hardware design. Okay. Um, as I said, over the years, uh, electronic hardware has become the core root of trust for all systems. Uh, you can think of your buildings, your pets, and everything in between. But at the same time, uh, and you have seen, been seeing, probably reading about this in the news, uh, we are going back to a different era, but a globalization of the electronic supply chain over the last two decades it has introduced numerous security issues. And uh, a range of securities. We'll talk about a few of them. And because of this, the hardware root of trust, the electronic hardware root of trust is no longer trustworthy. So the, the systems that use them are hence no longer trustworthy because if the foundation is uh, suspect, then the things that you build on that foundation is are no longer uh, trustworthy. So what I'll do is I'll paint my vision of hardware cybersecurity, but specifically focus on two things. So this is an uh, education class. So we'll uh, I'll look at some interaction. Uh, we'll do it together, um, uh, and uh, we'll see how hardware cybersecurity and the implications of hardware cybersecurity on how ICs and systems should be designed. Uh, 
and uh, more importantly, validate it. So, so this is what we will focus on this uh, in this class, uh, since that's what they call it. Um, but those of you, I hope most of you have a background in hardware. Uh, uh, if so, they probably heard of high-level synthesis. Uh, high-level synthesis is a design methodology. It translates high-level C, C++ specifications into gates. In general, it uses a subset of C, a subset of C++ that are synthesizable. And for those of you who are not aware of the history, high-level synthesis research and high-level synthesis uh, Commercialization started in early 1990s. Uh, in fact, uh, some companies had products uh, mid 90s and so on. However, it did not take off. High level synthesis as a design paradigm did not take off until very recently as a commercial product. The commercial products in the 90s, there are a few of them, they failed. Mm -hmm. The reasons being twofold one, HLS design generated designs were not ready for prime time. The performance, the power and the area metrics were not good enough, were not competitive relative to the other designs that were being generated by logic synthesis and other tools. So logic synthesis was sufficient and was effective in managing the complexity of the design. So you did not need this higher level uh, uh, design methodology. So circa 2012, uh, 20, uh, 2020 or beyond, uh, designing at these higher abstraction levels has become a prerequisite to manage complexity. Uh, in fact, uh, it's become uh, the designs generated by high-level synthesis tools at the same time have comp they be uh, the, the, have the high level synthesis tools have become competitive in terms of the ppa metrics performance power and area besides uh, this competitiveness in terms of uh, ppa metrics high level synthesis offers numerous benefits for example um, it reduces uh, design time because operating at the high level is that much easier manages design complexity reduces verification effort and enables uh, software, hardware, co-design and co-verification. Since you start, if you start with C, you put some of it in hardware, some of it in software, you can, uh, and you can do trade-offs like that. Uh, at the bottom, I have these uh, companies, Mentor, Cadence, Intel, Xilinx, and a few others offer high-level synthesis tools. In fact, a lot of companies, uh, uh, semiconductor companies, 14 out of the top 20, the last time I checked, do use uh, high-level synthesis as part of their design flows. So, and the typical applications domain that benefit from HLS initially in, uh, are um, communications, signal processing, computation, and crypto, mostly data-dominated applications, although there are some control-dominated applications where HLS and high-level design flow, uh, flows are being uh, uh, beginning to be used. Um, okay. So let's look at this particular chart, uh, the cumulative annual growth rate of... So, so let's look at why this is so, the, the complexity and so on. We see, the uh, as I said, high-level synthesis tools are a product can be seen as a productivity tool. If you look at the blue chart uh, line, the, that's the cumulative annual growth rate of gates per centimeter square. This is roughly growing at 59%. Uh, uh, and at the same time, the design productivity or the designer productivity is roughly about 25%. So this, you see that gap between those uh, existing and continuing to grow. So the claim of high level, uh, the, the, the pitch for high level synthesis is by raising this abstraction, design abstraction to C, C++, high level synthesis tools may allow one to bridge this gap. Um, as I said, it allows for early design space uh, exploration, high level synthesis, and uh, lots of applications, image processing, video compression, vision, crypto, ML, video components, and so on. In fact, what happens is, um, in fact, video components uh, in uh, the Tegra X1 chip are designed using catapult high-level synthesis tool. I think it's uh, 
Catapult used to be a standalone company. Now it's part of Mentor. Similarly, NVIDIA's 4K processing uh, unit was a, a designed with C-based HLS. Qualcomm designs parts of its uh, Snapdragon modules with Catapult HLS. So you can identify pieces of uh, the uh, design that can be that are amenable for high level synthesis. So, so let's look at, uh, so in a related trend, uh, what's happening is when you're looking at system design uh, of ICs uh, and so on, there's an increasing uh, use of third party IPs uh, and uh, that seems to be picking up even more. For example, um, at the 90 nanometer node, uh, there were about <coughs> 16 to 20 IP blocks in a type typical phone. Um, and uh, at the 22 nanometers node, and people are seeing about 200 IP blocks uh, in a system on a chip. So you see the you, there is that corresponding, uh, a, a related trend towards more use of uh, more of integration rather than design, if you notice, of uh, integration of multiple IPs and putting them together. Okay. So that's a related. So uh, of course, the increasing number of accelerators has uh, attendant benefits, right? Uh, uh, for example, quick design time, you don't have to design individual accelerators. Specialists of uh, accelerator companies can give you uh, uh, custom, uh, whatever, well-designed hardware accelerators. So now we are trading off integration for design time. Uh, and you benefit from the specialist focus on accelerators and cores. And uh, if you look at the red line, uh, it shows the, roughly by what, 2025 or so, 95% of it design could be accelerators sourced from third party vendors. Um, so now if you look at the blue line, that's a different trend. Uh, on IP accelerators, since each of them are, they may come from a different IP vendor, may compromise security of uh, the system that you're integrating them into. Attackers in the third-party IP vendor companies may embed backdoors and Trojans into the accelerators, right? Uh, let me see, yeah. Uh, you, let me. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, I was looking for something. Uh, so, uh, so the so so the blue line, as I said, shows the cybersecurity investments, actual and projected. Some of this may be to deal with uh, problems associated with these accelerators. Some of this may be when you integrate these accelerators, and others would be other aspects of cybersecurity, including bugs in software and so forth. Uh, so this is the focus uh, of this talk to look at uh, high level uh, approaches and the benefits and drawbacks of uh, using those high level approaches in, in the context of security. Okay. Uh, I'll wait for you to ask me questions. Otherwise I'll quickly get into me asking you a few questions. So to, so that uh, we have an interactive session here. So this is a typical design flow. Uh, if you look at it on the top left-hand side, you have a C specification, which is then translated into an intermediate representation called the control data flow graph. Uh, and this is what typical software compilers do as well. HLS, for example, leverages uh, GCC and LLVM compilers uh, backends in the scheduling step then, the operations in the CDFG are mapped to clock cycles. Uh, some of these operations may take one cycle, others may take multiple cycles. Uh, one can get, uh, for example, during scheduling fast schedules that consume a lot of resources, they are resource intensive, or slow schedules that take more time but are resource constrained. Uh, so following the, uh, after the scheduling step, of the CDFG onto the times into time cycle uh, time steps, uh, the binding step uh, does something else. It takes these scheduled operations and binds these operations to physical operators. For example, multiplication operations to multiplier operators, addition operations to adder operators, and so on. 
Similarly, it binds data transfer spanning clock boundaries or maps data transfer spanning clock boundaries to registers. Finally, you get a data path like I showed you at the bottom right. Uh, each state in the controller, uh, uh, the, you see the controller on top, uh, top right. Uh, each state corresponds to one clock cycle. Uh, and the controller, which is shown in that light blue thing, uh, uh, sends control signals to execute operations on specific operators and specific cycles. Since uh, operators and registers are reused, the same operators are reused in different cycles, you see the multiplexers, which is the trapezoids, uh, trapeziums you see there in front of them. And the select signals in the MUXs in the data path uh, are all controlled by the controller. So this is a one slide, three, four minute view of a typical high level synthesis process flow and high level design flow, okay? Uh, so what we have, what, there are numerous accelerator application domains. I mentioned image processing, video processing, and so on. But uh, what we have done recently is uh, we looked at a recent example in crypto. Um, and uh, this is, uh, for those of you, this is an application domain of crypto, but we looked at uh, or you can look at uh, this new domain of post-quantum crypto. A quick background, quantum computers can, uh, people have shown that, research has shown that quantum computers, whenever they are ready for prime time, can break uh, RSA and elliptic curve crypto. And for those of you who are aware and uh, know a little more, these are what are called private uh, public key crypto uh, or asymmetric key crypto. And similarly, Quantum computers have been, research have shown that quantum computers, whenever they're again ready for prime time, cannot break AES and SHA. These are kind of, one is a secret key or a private key crypto. So, just, uh, uh, and SHA is a hash algorithm. PQC, AC, so post-quantum crypto standardization is happening as we speak. And uh, PQC asymmetric crypto are replacements for RSA and ECC, and they are being developed. There are two components. One is the key generation method, and the second are key encapsulation mechanism. And the second one is what's called the signature verification. The US NIST, National Institute of Standards and Technology, is standardizing PQC algorithms. And here is the process. You have round one, there, there were 82 submissions worldwide. Then uh, after a couple of iterations, uh, uh, in round one, there were, the, the, in round one, there were most, the, these submissions were mostly evaluated for security and uh, down selected to 26 of these uh, candidates. Then round three or 15. And in these two iterations, you were looking for performance, power, and security, both main channel and side channel security. So a couple of, uh, there were some winners announced uh, probably a month or two ago. Uh, for digital signatures, you had Christos, Dilithium, Falcon, and Sphinx for KEM, which is the key generation method. It's Crystal Skyber, I think, and there are a few more other evaluations going on. So, so this is uh, a, an important new crypto domain, and these are extremely complex algorithms. And what we have done is, uh, we used HLS to study the implementation trade-offs of these PQC standards. In fact, uh, we have the C codes for all of these round two submissions. For those of you who are interested, uh, just send me an email and I can share with you the link. We have the C code that can be synthesized directly into either FPGA is Xilinx FPGAs or into uh, ASIC. So we used the Xilinx HLS. At that point, it was called Vivada. Now it's called Vitus to study the implementation level trade-offs. Uh, as I said, these codes are publicly available. While the designs uh, the, uh, that these generate at this point might be less efficient and customizable, but they are useful for design space exploration. So what I did over the last two slides is introduced high-level synthesis 
showed high level synthesis can be used to accelerate uh, post quantum crypto accelerators. Just a high level view. I won't go any further into that. Uh, so what I want to do now is to look at security aware high level synthesis of high uh, accelerators. So what I want to do is switch to security as a design metric. As I uh, until recently, power performance in the area were the only three metrics, and we want to bring security side by side these metrics. Uh, and until now, most hardware security research has focused on gate level, netless, and bay and beyond physical level, and so on. Obviously, when you get to this gate level or even into the layout level, you lose important semantic information. And I'll give you some, as we go through, you will see some of these things, uh, why we lose and how we lose some of that information. Uh, and we are left with mostly structural information, gates, interconnections of gates, or standard cells and connections between standard cells, mostly structural information. So securing the right parts is usually hard at those levels when you lose some of this important semantic context. Uh, what security aware high level synthesis could allow one is to secure a design at the algorithmic level where this context is not lost, the semantic meaning, uh, the semantics are still retained. So that is our uh, claim. So what we are saying here is algorithm level security secures, can be used to secure meaningful semantic information, even so our claim is uh, even a non-security conscious designer or design engineer can easily identify things that are sensitive, saying this algorithm is sensitive, or this block is sensitive. And that can inform protection of uh, that sensitive asset at this high level. Um, the two high level uh, stages where we focus on are high level synthesis and register transfer level synthesis. Both of them have semantic information, while gate and layer level have less semantic information and more structural information. And in fact, uh, if you look at this table, you see on the hardware and the, the hardware and the software and the analogies uh, there, the gate level is roughly equivalent to the assembly level. Layout is maybe a binary algorithm level on one side, high level synthesis equivalent to the compiler level stuff. So of course, these are all complementary and have made uh, use a useful role to play. Okay. So uh, just to reiterate, uh, if you don't remember anything, the yellow slides, I put them in the beginning in the middle and at the end mm -hmm. is that high level synthesis is a promising level to design security accelerators is a promising level to design in security. And we'll look at a couple of examples of security, designing and security. Ben and Hammond, how much more time do I have? Maybe I took a little-, little No, more. you're all right. You've probably got another 15 minutes. 15 minutes, so maybe. So what I want to do is um, look at, uh, a Trojan detection, um, right? How many of you are aware of what a hardware Trojan is? So I, uh, uh, maybe hands up or uh, thumbs up and so on. If you... Okay, so there's a couple of hands up, uh, thumbs up in the Zoom participant. Okay. Yeah. So what we'll focus on, that's good. Uh, I haven't, uh, I'm, I'm not able to see all of them at the same time. That's good, thanks. Uh, so at the high level, what uh, I want to focus on is uh, third party IP vendors and rogues in those IP vendor companies. When they source you some uh, IP, they may have, they may introduce some back doors uh, be, beyond the existing requ requested functionality. Right? It could subsume bugs as well. Of course, uh, you have to trust someone. So we assume that the, you, the SOC integrator is trustworthy, but when you're integrating all these components, can you somehow build a system that is trustworthy as well, right? So the individual IPs are potentially not trustworthy and the SOC integrator that uses the high level synthesis tool is trustworthy. And it's also likely, if, uh, so it's likely that if you the if the three PIP modules are sourced from the same vendor, potentially there are some issues with that, and we'll look at that, right? 
look at them. So these are the various things that could happen. Uh, so, uh, so let's look at this malicious third party IP. You source an IP, you get it from the vendor. Uh, 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 here it's a multiplier IP, potentially there's a backdoor. How do you detect that? During high level synthesis is a question. Uh, as I said, we'll focus on uh, uh, just as a quick re recap, high level synthesis for true. This is a example, C, uh, rough C like code on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, you have a scheduled uh, operation, a scheduled CDFG. And you also have a CDFG that is bound. You F1 is the multiplier number one, A1 is adder number one. So if you carefully look at this, you require about two multipliers and two adders to implement this particular design. And it takes about five cycles. So, so the question is, how do you do Trojan detection within this context, right? We have a HLS tool. It can generate this uh, stuff, uh, such a design bound and so on. I didn't show you the final layout, but uh, final uh, RTL block diagram, but this is a good. And then how do you detect, uh, how do I go back to, okay, maybe, okay. So how do you detect a uh, malicious IP in this context? Spend a couple of minutes, think about it. Again, I, as Hammond said, uh, tell me what could you, what can we do here? So this is just a regular design and you are sourcing IP from multiple, uh, you're sourcing IP. One of the IPs could be untrustworthy. How would you detect it during this one as an integrator? Any thoughts? Any just type in stuff and we'll or unmute yourself and tell us what you would like, what you could, what you may want, what could be, what a designer could do. Any suggestions? Yeah, feel free to unmute and suggest something. Nothing is wrong in this class or in general in my class. There are no wrong answers, no penalties for wrong answers because there are no wrong answers. The other way I could do is I can call up names because you're only four or five of you. You could um, have a bunch of test cases or a verification to make sure our design still works fine, even with the Trojan. Mm -hmm. but, so that wouldn't detect if the Trojan is like a backdoor Trojan and it's hidden in there, it's not activated. Cool, so testing, verification, yeah. validation, that's a good point. Any other design approaches? Testing is a good thing. Well, after you, even after you design, you have to verify. Any Hammond, pick up uh, someone else other than, I, I can't see all the names, so why don't you ask one more? Let's look at. Uh, yeah, there's a few names here. Um, Jiwei, Jiwei Feng. Yeah, any subject. So maybe I'll pick the, so if to detect natural faults, this is one architecture, which is duplicate and check, right? This is one suggestion that I have. So let's uh, see how many of you think that this works for Trojan detection. Maybe just hands up. Uh, 
or down. We, we want all of your feedback on this. All, all you have to do is yes or no. Don't know is not an answer. You should take a stand. So this is one thing where I make two copies. Uh, yeah, so should I come in? Yes. I mean, don't you think this is an unoptimized approach? I mean, you're duplicating uh, for, you know, you're spending too much on uh, trying to detect a Trojan, whereas which could have been done possibly by being a bit more uh, intelligent in design or maybe after test. So mm -hmm. is this, you know, why, why do you, uh, you know, duplicate everything while it's not necessary? I mean, okay. Trojan may be triggering something, some part of that. Why, why do you need to duplicate everything? Good question. Yeah. So this is, so if cost is not a, so this is a good uh, point, but if I have unlimited resources, is the, is this a good technique? Let's, so if resources are not a constraint, I agree with you. Usually life is uh, all about optimization and uh, trade-offs. What if this is it? Hardware is not a constraint. I have no constraints on the number of multipliers, adders, and so on. Does this work? Is that a? Uh, I agree with you. One well, is, how, how, do, how do you guarantee that the second one isn't compromised either? Okay, good point. Anybody else has an issue? So uh, what if I? So what is the? So could? You, what is the second one mean? Tell me. I mean the duplicate that you're talk, talking about. Okay. Like I, are, are you planning to have, assuming that you have one that works fine and the other one, there may be a chance of a Trojan sitting somewhere. Is that what you're planning to do by duplicate and check? Is that What's a reasonable? No, no, no. That's a good question. Is that a reasonable uh, assumption from me? So, so let's look at where, so this is an excellent point. Anybody, so I'll get back to this. How do you make sure that the two copies, uh, the second copy, Right, M, for example, M1 and if M1 has a Trojan, how do you guarantee that M3 does not have a Trojan? Right, that's your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some, someone, yeah. Something like that. Anybody else? So, is this if resources are not a constraint? How many of you think that this is a good idea? I want a yes or a no. Hammond, did anybody say yes? How many said yes, and how many said no? Um, wait. There's a thumb, there's one thumbs up, but I don't know if thumbs up means yes or no. I'm going to assume thumbs up means yes. Yeah. So we need uh, more thumbs ups or more, uh, more thumbs down. So whatever it is. Can you uh, do a uh, thumbs down? Or a cross or something. No. It's an I think you can now with uh, lots of emoji reactions. Yeah, you can pick an emoji. So we will interpret your emojis accordingly. As I said, we want it to be very interactive. After my initial 20, I was hoping that would be 10 minutes. Maybe I should have, come. but anyway, that's okay. I'm not, uh, just as instructions, um, Ben, do you want to explain how you do the emojis if people don't know how to do that? Okay. Um, for those of you uh, on, I think most Zoom interfaces, uh, excepting mobile, on the bottom is a little control bar of the Zoom window. And you should be able to click reactions. Now, if your Zoom client is up to date, I think there's a little um, kind of yeah. uh, circumflex yeah. thing that you, uh, I mean, you can click reactions. There's a three dot menu that says more. And then from there, you can pick other uh, kind of reactions. And so I've just reacted with the scream emoji right there. Cause Zoom is scary. Okay, I'll, just to use the default ones, let's say there's there's, there's both thumbs up and clap are the first two suggestions. So if this is unreasonable, do clap. And if this is reasonable, do thumbs up. That's probably the easiest way to do it. Okay, so we've got two reasonables. We've got two sets of thumbs ups mm -hmm. uh, and two abstentions. Yeah, we want those abstains to make us take a stand. It doesn't matter what it is. Just take a stand. Yes, sir. Okay, no. we've got a third thumbs up. Cool. Let me force. Okay, so maybe, so let's good. So I'll get back. To, so this is a, let me see. Uh, so the couple of interesting things, right? Let me go back here. Uh, let me, I'll show you. Maybe I got the, so if you look at it, if you source it 
you when you buy a multiplier IP, you usually buy one multiplier IP from, from a single company. So if you take a multiplier which has a backdoor, here I put a this uh, whatever horns to show that it is a Trojan. So if you make two copies, both copies will have the same Trojan, right? So even so, duplication. I hope that uh, makes sense. So even if you make duplicate copies, right, you will still have the same issue because both copies have the same backdoor. And uh, if one can trigger one backdoor in one copy, they can trigger the same backdoor in the other copy and can evade detection. Does this make sense? So is this something you had in mind? Uh, the, uh, I forget his name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Something like this, right? Yes, yes. So as I said, let's not even worry about the resources. So duplication and so why does this not work for uh, for in false natural faults you have random faults in one cop usually doesn't have the same cop fault in every copy that's the assumption for reliability whereas for for security if you have a backdoor in one that is not detected or not detectable then it appears in all copies so it doesn't matter what you do you see that so that's where the issue is you you sourced a multiplier for one from one vendor and you make multiple copies reuse them and so on so you have the thing trojan all over even if you do duplicate and check right so reliability does not imply security and okay so what's the solution for this now let's look at this design so we figured out that if there is a backdoor and I'll stop at the end of this uh, Trojan detection. The rest you can uh, check later on. We don't have to go beyond this. I'll take three, four more minutes, Hammond, to come. Uh, uh, that sounds good. Finish this. So what would you do? So this doesn't work. Duplicate and check doesn't work. So what would you do then? Well, uh, simulate, but that's, that's pretty costly, right? I mean, if, if you want to check all paths and try to trigger the Trojan. No, you, you're not able to assume that you cannot trigger, right? Because the, okay. the, the attacker was so, you know, unless you do exhaustive. So this is duplication and checking doesn't work. So any other suggestions using this duplication? What is the foundational issue with this, right? That's my question. So if you look at this, you're sourcing from a vendor. And if you, once you source from a vendor, even a, if you miss that particular Trojan, it, it's all over, right? I guess you have to need to test each building block against a copy from a different vendor. So you want to get it from a different vendor. So, so that's where, it, so, so now you look at it this, instead of sourcing from one vendor, now you source it from multiple vendors, right? So let's look at something like that. Uh, so there could be some collusions, right? Parent child collusion. So we'll, so we'll look at this. So what you want to do is get it from two different vendors as somebody mentioned, right? So you take the same multiplier and get it from two different vendors. If you look at that, if you think of that, the likelihood that two vendors collude, assume that the vendors don't collude, and otherwise it becomes even more problematic. If you source them from two different vendors, take two multipliers, one from vendor one, one from vendor two, then you only use multipliers from one vendor on this side and multiplier from the other vendor from this side, right? And that way you can potentially detect because if this gets triggered uh, or the multiplier, the Trojan and the multipliers used on this side get triggered, they, even if they get, if uh, another, since the Trojans are not identical because it's, there is no, no collusion, you can potentially detect them at runtime. Does that make sense? So you need to source the same operation, operator from multiple vendors. And then there are a couple of more uh, things that go on. Even if you do that, uh, uh, even if they and if they collude, 
the vendors collude, then uh, then there's problems. So you want to prevent collusions. There are two types of collusions. One is just sourced from multiple vendors. Then you have these collusions where this module can somehow impose what this does. Uh, this is called the parent telling what the child to do. That's uh, called the parent-child collusion. There's also a uh, parent-parent collusion. These two modules can tell what to do with this module. So these are from the same vendor and these two collude and this vendor B is not in, uh, uh, in bed with these things, still you can have some stuff. So it's not as easy as sourcing from multiple vendors. So you, uh, you could have these parent-child collusion, parent-to-parent -parent collusion, and during binding step, you can do this uh, collusion prevention step. So I'll give you a color this CDFG, Again, uh, I, and this is even more costly, more expensive than when, if you thought that the other thing was expensive, it's not just more copy or more resources, but you're sourcing them from multiple vendors. Each of them, you have to pay extra, right? If you source it from one vendor, you are only uh, paying once. So now you have three different colors. So you're getting three different vendors. And if you look at the multiplier here, you have the multiplier coming from green vendor, orange vendor and a teal vendor. So you essentially are sourcing from, and these are hypothetical example, but you can think about this, right? So you have three vendors and, and this is a, a, a nice binding where you map things so that there is no, you prevent the parent to parent and the parent to child collusion. So it's not just duplication, it's uh, and check, it's duplicate and diversify and check. The diversification comes from sourcing the multiple vendors. I hope you go. So on that note, I'll stop right here. I won't go into the IP theft. You can, I'll share the slides. I hope you got this idea where Trojans at the high level is easy, uh, is an interesting idea when you source IPs and uh, you have to duplication that is used for reliability doesn't work. Um, and just by sourcing from multiple vendors doesn't work either because uh, vendors could potentially collude. There are two types of collusion, parent-parent and parent-child. And by nicely binding, uh, intervening at the binding step during high-level synthesis and this multiple vendors and multiple modules, you could potentially detect Trojans at runtime. Of course, there's the cost implications and so on. So this is, an, uh, this is a high-level idea and think about this, read the read this paper, there are lots of trade-offs that we suggested and there are others that have suggested additional trade-offs. On that note, I went six minutes over, Amman. That's okay. Any so I'll stop it right here and let uh, Hammond. Okay, while I get set up, if you have any questions for Ramesh, you can either call them out or just drop them into the Zoom chat. I'll yeah. just take two seconds to get my slides going. Do you want to stop sharing, Ramesh? Yeah, I can do that. Anyway, I want to thank you for... Uh, uh, asking those commenting on those because that was very useful be buzzed and others who raised your hands and so on yeah thank you thank you it was a nice way that you demonstrated everything right from scratch up to some advanced stuff yeah. great great testing too okay um so i am going to now share my screen and i'm going to talk through um this is a hopefully you can see my slides um, I'm going to talk through a particular case study on um, uh, some techniques that are often used for testing whether or not systems have been implemented correctly. So this is a little bit different to what Ramesh was just talking about, but hopefully um, you can kind of see how it fits into the broader scheme of things with regards to this integrated circuit stuff. So let's, let's, uh, let's just immediately dive straight into it. Um, so why are we actually interested in testing? Well, Whenever you're implementing an integrated circuit, it's really important that you a, know that it works. Um, but even beyond knowing that it works, you want to make sure that the uh, you know every single chip that you produce is working correctly. So by ensuring that you have really uh, you know really good testing frameworks and testing environments, you can hopefully identify what part of your manufacturing systems are you know aren't necessarily working, and so ideally improve yield and things that way. Um, and you know certain kinds of uh, integrated circuit tests can also try and minimize or eliminate different types of security risks as well. Um, 
there are uh, two or three, or actually there are lots of different ways that we can do tests, but typically the two major ones is either you have some kind of built-in self-test where upon, for instance, power up or upon some trigger, the device will test itself according to some you know, set of tests uh, and, and then, you know, report whether or not that those tests passed. Um, this is quite nice because it doesn't necessarily leak any information, but it has um, possibly some kind of low coverage because depending on the complexity of your device, having a, a built-in testing framework may not be able to cover you know, the full functionality of that system without in massively increasing the overhead of your design. Um, in addition, if the test is only built in and you can't interact with it in any way other than starting it and then viewing the result, uh, you can't kind of get any insights into why a chip might be failing. You'll only know that a chip is failing. So there's two main downsides there. Uh, well, three main downsides there. Uh, the first one is that low coverage. The second one is the overhead in the design included by having a built-in self-test. And then the third one is when a test fails, you don't necessarily know why. The alternate or the major alternate is to use something called scanning. So scans uh, are very popular for logic testing. They enable you to do uh, basically inspect a given integrated circuit at any given time and view it, look at all the different registers inside that design and try and work out what the, the you know, those should be versus what you're measuring them to be. Um, so this gives you a great amount of insight into what's going on with that particular design. Um, and What's more, it allows you to do de debugging once the chip has been made and, and actually perform infield maintenance if you're also able to scan values into the chip. So let's have a look at how this works. So here's, here's the general circuit design of some integrated circuit. Let's say there's a combinational, uh, there's a set of combinational circuits um, with inputs and outputs, and there's some set of registers inside. Okay, so what we're interested with scanning is we want to know what the values of those registers are. So how can we do that? Well, the trick is we add what's called the scan chain. And a scan chain is basically just a series of multiplexes which are associated with each register and pathways between those registers so that we can, uh, with a mode bit, choose whether or not the registers are connected to the normal combinational circuit or are connected to one another in a kind of daisy chain. Um, so let's have a look at how that looks like. Here's the scan process where, for instance, we're scanning values in and out of those registers. We use the multiplexes to bypass the combinational circuit. And we uh, then can feed values into the registers and also feed the values out of the registers. How does that allow us to test the combinational circuit? Well, if we know what that circuit is supposed to be, we can use the scanning in to, to, to set every register to what we want it to be for a particular test. We can then put the multiplexes into the normal mode. We can put the scan chain into the normal mode. We can run that combinational circuit, run the design, and then we can scan out the values at the end of the next tick or some set of ticks, and then try and ensure whether or not our uh, circuit behaved as we expected and gave us the results that we expected. So uh, in other words, we can also deactivate the scan chain like this uh, and then run the circuit in the normal mode. And so by switching between the scan mode and the normal mode, we can test our design very, very thoroughly. Scan mode, normal mode. So as a result of the, the, the you know, really handy flexibility um, of, that scan chains give you, probably greater than 80% of all integrated circuits use some kind of scan chain for testing and debugging and validation of their designs. And the scan chain infrastructure is widely supported in tool chains. Um, so both Mentor Graphics and Synopsys have a variety of different built-in scan chain infrastructures for you. Um, you know, and FPGAs have them as well. Um, loading the configuration bitstream into an FPGA is a bit like scanning something in. And you can also read out those bitstreams for debugging as well. So, so scan chains definitely win the, win the techniques used for um, doing designs. But the problem is scan chains may also be a portal for hackers. So if you consider something like a cryptography implementation in an integrated circuit um, where you have some kind of algorithm, like for instance, DES or AES, which has some scan chain, which allows you to scan values in and out of the registers. Now you might be able to use that scan chain to perform an attack on the device and try and extract secrets such as embedded security keys. Uh, so, you know, there may be some defenses where we can randomize the layout of the scan chain, um, but even then you may be able to overcome those defenses. So let's have a look at how uh, this, this could potentially happen. And that's what today's presentation is going to be about. So when we've got um, 
crypto and crypto integrated circuit security, the, the goal is you never ever want to permit access to partially encrypted data. Because if you, for instance, consider you know DES or AES, these algorithms operate in rounds. And uh, if you enable the user to access an early round of the encryption, that value is not completely protected yet and it hasn't got the full protection of the um of the encryption algorithm over it um but the problem is that scan chains may provide such access because if we consider for instance here in this diagram the des algorithm uh which is operating over rounds you could suspend the algorithm you could suspend the implementation before the encryption is completed and then use the scan chain to scan out intermediate values of the computation so how might such an attack occur? Well, the first step is you'll need to access the scan infrastructure. So if you've got a design like this one where there is a scan chain in it, well, okay, um, you know, what if I just don't expose those to the pins on the devices? Surely that would be protected. But of course, we know that's not protected. We can decap an integrated circuit, we can expect it, uh, we can inspect it, and then we can try and identify where those scan chain infrastructure is uh, and, and extract and connect to it in that way. Once you've eventually connected to the scan chain, um, and you know, even if it's got a password or something, you know, we of course we you know, there are techniques to bypass those as well. Eventually, once you've connected to the scan chain, what we'll try and do is use it to observe the internal state, uh, and that's what we're going to be playing around with today. Um, so the general process is we're going to be swapping between the normal mode and the scan mode of a given piece of infrastructure, and then analyze the responses um, for uh, the the system and. If, in the attack we're doing today, we'll only be scanning out data rather than scanning in data. But of course, as we remember from this, we can actually scan in data as well. So for particularly advanced attacks, you might choose to instead uh, control the registers in that way and, and to scan values in as well as scan them out. But today we'll just look at how we scan things out and can perform an attack. So today's demonstration, we're going to actually attack the DES data encryption standard. Now, this is quite an old standard. It was actually standardized in 1977 and it is now considered obsolete. It's been replaced with AES. Um, I'll note that scan attacks on both DES and AES are, pop, uh, are both possible and have been demonstrated in the literature. I choose to talk about DES today because it's a much simpler algorithm. And so as a result, the scan attack is a lot more simple as well. It means we have a chance to go over it in the 40 minutes, um, whereas AES would take a lot longer to explain how it works. So let's just quickly uh, understand DES. How does it work? Um, decryption is just simply the reverse of the encryption step. Um, the encryption takes place over a 64-bit plain text plus some 56-bit key, which produces a ciphertext. And decryption is just the ciphertext plus the key again um, gives you the plain text. And the algorithm itself um, is uh, very straightforward. It, it, uh, it operates over rounds. And the only difference between uh, encryption and decryption is that you invert the rounds. So you just perform the algorithm backwards. Um, as a result, this was quite popular for hardware implementations because the, the implementation of encryption and decryption are the same, it's just one is operated in reverse. Um, there are 16 identical rounds, every single round has the same functionality, um, and um, those for those rounds, uh, the 56-bit secret key um, is converted into 16 48-bit round keys. So let's have a look at the implementation. Um, each round operates over um, some function called function f, um, and in this function we take the, the the data, which has been split into two registers, the left register and the right register, which is just 32 bits of um, the, the input data on each side. Um, it's expanded using some function E, which is essentially just a permutation. Um, it is then XORed with the round key, um, split up and then passed through substitution boxes um, S1 through S8. They take six bits of the values um, and then return a, a four bit result, which is then permuted to give you the, the resulting function, which becomes, which is XORed with the left register and becomes the new right register. Okay. And this just repeats itself over and over again. So this, um, uh, this operation is iterative um, and it happens 16 times. Um, there's two uh, other things to note. The first thing is the input permutation, the block IP at the beginning that just simply reorders the bits in the data. It doesn't offer any cryptographic protection whatsoever. Um, and likewise, the final permutation at the bottom is again, has no cryptographic benefit. It's just reordering the bits in the, in the, register, uh, in the, in the results. Um, you'll notice on the right hand side there, you see this round key derivation. This is where we're taking some 64-bit input key. We get 
um, 56 bits of key out of that input key because the other bits are just parity bits. Uh, and then we, we rotate the two halves of this key periodically um, between each round um, so that uh, uh, we have a unique sort of seed, if you will. And that value then gets permuted itself using a value, uh, using a function called PC2. So all of these are just different rearranging algorithms, essentially. So let's have a look at the hardware that we might use to implement this. Um, this is a this would be suitable for something like uh, Cypher blockchaining. This is an iterative architecture. Of course, there are other implementations. You could make this a pipelined architecture, or you could make it, um, you know, something that just did it all in one pass combinatorially. Um, but the iterative architecture is what we'll focus on today. Um, so how does this work? We've got some input register, which is what we'll pass in our values into. Um, uh, that's going to pass through some combinational function, the initial permutation, and then get loaded into the L and R registers. Then we'll have some control logic, which is essentially just a counter, right? It's just going to count to 16. Um, and that will encrypt those values uh, in the 16 different rounds against the round keys. Because the round keys are static, um, the, they're based purely on the embedded secret key, you might consider that these round keys were saved into a ROM. Uh, so these might be embedded into the design and the, the key values can then be uh, chosen as needed to encrypt each of the 16 rounds of the design. Uh, once the, the, the counter has reached 16, instead of performing another addition, it passes those L and R registers through the final permutation before loading it into the output register there. Okay, and so that function F in the middle, that's purely combinational. Uh, there's no there's no memory inside of it. Um, so the only re uh, memory here, the only registers that you might find in the scan chain would be your input register, your output register, and the L and R registers. So in total, that gives you 192 flip-flops to be um, uh, playing with. Okay, so how, how what's the what's the goal of the scan attack here? Um, the objective is to obtain the secret key. That's what we're trying to do. What does the attacker know? Well, it knows the block cipher algorithm. DES is a public standard. You can download it. You can look at it. You can uh, understand the math that goes into it. And in addition, we assume that the attacker also knows the details of the IP core, i.e. the circuit diagram, right? So this circuit diagram is probably published in a, in a, in a schematic or a uh, data sheet for the IP block. And once they have identified that the IP block they're attacking is that particular one, they'll be able to look at the specification to determine things like the high level timing diagram and the number of flip flops and so on. What the attacker does not know is two things. Firstly, the structure of the scan chain. We assume there is a scan chain, otherwise this attack isn't going to work. Um, but it doesn't. It's not necessarily going to tell you the, the the structure of the scan chain. What do we mean by structure? Well, that's the order in which these registers are connected together, right? And it's not even necessarily that it's like, okay, is it the input register followed by the L register followed by you know whatever? It's the each individual bit in the register might be jumbled, which and you'd hope that it was to to provide some additional security. So the first bit of the scan chain might be you know the seventh bit of the input register. And then the next bit might be the 12th bit of the R register and so on and so forth. Uh, meaning that the just when you scan it out, it might be quite tricky to try and work out which bits correspond to which parts of the hardware. The other thing the attacker does not know is obviously the secret key. That's what we're trying to obtain. So what we're going to do now is we're going to switch into a Google Collab, which is where I'm going to actually perform the attack. Um, I've got it present on my screen here now. I'm going to copy this link and drop it into the Zoom chat. Uh, can you just confirm that uh, you have got um the uh, you can see the uh the the link and also on my screen you can see the google collab the text on the your screen is a little small we have the link to follow along okay cool oh uh, yeah the text might be a bit small actually maybe i could zoom in that's a good idea let's zoom in i'll zoom into 150 percent Okay, so um, feel free to run this on uh, as I go through. You'll be able to um, play with this yourself. Um, it, I've given you only view access, so you can also try and make a, a, a copy of this yourself. Um, so I'm just going to reconnect to my um, Google Colab now. Um, and I just, you can only run this first box once. So I just want to make sure that that's correct. Okay, so the first thing we do is we're just going to um, grab our preliminaries and the preliminaries essentially is the implementation of the hardware. So um, this is how it works. I've zoomed in a bit now, but that's okay. So how is it working? We've got some implementation called DES with scan chain, and that gives us some functions, which are the public functions that we're going to be able to interact with. We have an initialization function, and we have a function that runs either an encryption or decryption. So while this is, of course, is a software implementation, this is very um, emblematic of 
uh, an implementation that was in hardware, right? So we would be able to do only two things, um, tell it to start up, and then once it started up, we'd be able to tell it to either encrypt or decrypt data. Now, I do have one additional um, argument here, which is the number of rounds. So how do I control the number of rounds? Well, if you consider that this was a hard, a piece of hardware, there's a, num there's a clock connected to that hardware, right? Which I toggled to, to trigger the hardware. If I'm toggling that clock to make it run, uh, I could choose to stop running it before I know it's completed. So that means that if I know that the standard set, you know, that the system says I need 18 clock ticks before the value is completed, um, which is the default here, I could stop those clock ticks after three and, and then have a look at the scan chain, which is what this emulated hardware lets you do. Um, so it, that is very representative of, of a real, um, I've got to have my hands on this, I can control it in, in however, uh, however I want to. Okay. So it implements the algorithm that I showed before. So this is, um, you know, this is just the same picture from the slides um, and it implements it with the hardware layout that I showed in the slides as well. So this is all very zoomed in because I zoomed in so you can see the text. So let's have a play at running it. Um, so I can run it here just to, to, to see how it works. So for instance, I import my um, DES scan chain. You can ignore that squiggly line. That's just Google Colab being strange. Um, I define some seed. This uh, When I initialize my design, the seed will be used to come up with the, the key and also the scan chain layout. So it's fully random. I have no idea what it is. Um, and now I can actually invoke my code. So here's my input. It's some um, hexadecimal thing that's 64 bits long. Here's my input. I load the ciphertext by running the, the encryption or the decryption function here. Here it is. Um, the ciphertext comes back out. So here's the encrypted ciphertext. Now what I can do is pass that into the, the system again. And this time I'm going to tell it to decrypt it and we get the plain text back out again, right? Okay, so I can see it's working. I pass in an input, I encrypt it and print what's encrypted and then I get back out the, the plain text value. So how are we going to do this attack? The first thing we need to do is determine the scan chain structure. How do we determine the scan chain structure? Well, we need to reverse engineer the locations of each flip-flop for the input, the L, and the R registers. We can't kind of determine what the uh, intermediate values are if we can't identify where the, uh, the intermediate values are in the, um, uh, the flip-flop. Uh, so how are we gonna do that? Well, we can reset the DES hardware to clear all the registers. And then what we can do is just provide a single bit of input, right? One followed by all zeros. And if we look at this hardware again, I'm just going to zoom back out so we can see it. Input permutation is a constant, um, you know, it's just a reordering of bits. Uh, and then we've got the multiplexer and a multiplexer that then loads the L and the R register. So if I run this for two cycles, i.e., so if I, so, so hang on, let me rewind. If I provide an input with only one bit set and all zeros, and run it for two cycles. Uh, first, there'll be one bit of the input register set in the first cycle, and then there'll be one bit of either the L register or the R register that's set um, in the second clock cycle, because that's the, the order at which this will propagate. And there should only be one bit set because no strange combinational encryption function has occurred yet, only a permutation which reorders it. Okay, so the first bit comes in, we have one bit in the input register, we run the next clock tick, and somewhere one of the two L registers or the R registers will gain a single bit. So if we scan out after the first clock cycle, that first bit that we see is gonna be the, the, the bit of the input register that we've now identified. Then we run one more clock cycle, we scan it out again, we'll see that the L register or the R register, one of those two bits will be set somewhere. And we can work out which of the two registers it is by just doing the reverse of the initial permutation. So let's have a look at the code that does that. Okay, so we provide it with the input eight and then remaining zeros, i.e. this is 64 bits with the leftmost bit set. We run it for one clock cycle such that the input register is loaded. We scan out the bit stream pattern. Then we run it for an additional clock cycle and then we scan out the bit stream pattern. The first pattern will only have one bit active, which co corresponds with the input register's active bit. The pattern two will have two bits uh, active. Uh, one of those will be the same as the input registers bit, and the other one will be the L and R register. So how are we going to do this? This is uh, exactly what I said. So we're going to run a loop. The, 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 the bit is going to be the first that's going to be the leftmost bit, and then the next leftmost bit, and so on and so forth. We're going to run that in, uh, the, the hardware for just two cycles. We're going to first identify which bit is the input register. 
uh, and then we're going to identify which bit is the L and the R register. Uh, and then we're going to invert the initial permutation to try and work out, uh, you know, which of those uh, L and R registers it is, uh, because we have to undo this to, to, to work that out. So if I run this now, here we go. Here's all our indices. So in my scan chain, I have 192 bits. The 186th bit is the first bit of the input register. The 119th bit is the second bit of the input register, and so on and so forth. Um, now worked out what the each bit in the scan chain actually corresponds to in the hardware. So that first protection that we had, which is the scan chains randomized, is totally defeated. Okay, I just got a, a warning. Zoom says that my internet connection is unstable. So if you hear my voice crackling or anything, just let me know and I'll repeat something. Okay, um, so what's step two? So step two is we want to uh, determine the round key one value. So to do this, what we're going to need to do is be able to dump the contents of the L and R registers um, after some number of cycles. To do that, we're going to just define this helper function here. So this takes in the scan chain and our L and R indices here and just dumps the values for us. So here's an example. Um, you know, after some scan, we, we get these values, L register and R register. And we're going to use these values later on. We, in fact, we're going to use this function a lot, so it's important that we define it. So now we actually need to talk about how we do the decryption. So in order to in order to do the decryption, we first need to understand how it works. Um, if we have a look at the, the the AES functional diagram, which is this one, we can come up with equations that consider the relationship between the output here E and the inputs, the L and the R registers. So we can define an equation for A, which is after the expansion function E. We can define an equation for B. We can define an equation for point C, point D, and point E. And then eventually that gets loaded into the R values. And that's what these equations here are. OK, so A is the expansion value of R0. B is the A XOR with the key one bit. And remember, the K1 is the value we're interested in. Then C is the substitution boxes of B. D is the permutation function over C, and then R1 is the value of E, which itself is uh, the left register XORed with the D value, and then L1 becomes the, the, uh, the old R0. So this is the, the process of a full encryption round. Okay, so there's relatively straightforward. Most of these are directly invertible. Um, so uh, E is a simple permutation, so we can invert that directly. Um, uh, we, we're interested in working out what K1 is, so we don't know that value yet. Um, but if we work backwards, this is a this is just an XOR, and we, we can control the value of L0, which means um, we can invert that XOR operation. Um, P is a simple permutation, so we can invert that. The big challenge here is the S boxes. So how do the S boxes work? Well, they're actually fixed substitutional values, and they're much more tricky to invert. So why is that? Well, here's a here's an S box. Um, S1. So this is the for the first um, six bits. How does an S box work? Well, it takes an, a six bit input, um, does this lookup table, and then returns the value from within the table. So let's have a look. Let's let's assume that we got some value. Let's say um, all ones, for instance. Let's say we got all ones. So if we've got all ones, we first determine the uh, row we're in by using uh, it's one followed by some values, and then a one at the end. So we know we're in the bottom row. And then the column, it's all ones in the middle. So we know that it's going to return the value 13. So, okay, well, hopefully that's just directly invertible. But if we look at the table a little closely, we can actually see that there are more than one 13 in here. There's a 13 here. There's a 13 here. Oh, can you see my cursor, by the way? Is that something Zoom does? Maybe I need to like put on a laser pointer or something. It's there. It's just a little, if you move it too quickly, we'll okay. lose track. Okay, I'll, I'll keep it slow. So there's a 13 where we said, uh, and then there's a 13 here under um, 101000. Uh, and there's a 13 in the next row above as well, just here, 001101. And there's a 13 over here, 000100. Okay, so if we know that we've got the value 13, that means there's four possible input values. That's going to be a little bit tricky to reverse. It's it's not directly invertible. Okay, so um, that's all this text is saying. So that means that if there's four possible outputs for each value, we actually need to have multiple copies of this uh, of this to to try and work out um, 
we need yeah, basically we need more than one input so that we can construct some kind of simultaneous equation for this. Um, so given that we can set the value a arbitrarily and we know we can set the value a arbitrarily because we can set r zero arbitrarily and e is just some permutation that means that we can uh, control this to, to provide a number of different inputs to XOR essentially against that key value and we know that the key value is static um, so that means that we can essentially control this to try and work out what the, the, the operation is going to be statically. So based on the S box value, well rather based on the table for the S boxes, we need to come up with equations which will govern uh, uniquely producing an individual row and column um, for a set of possible key values. Um, I don't want to go through this derivation because it's a little bit tricky and we haven't got a tremendous amount of time, but if you're interested, you can you can go through this text yourself. But um, what I really want to bring your attention to is this, this, this figure here. So essentially from the relationship between the key and the um, S box, we can provide these three specially crafted inputs. And then based on what they return, it'll tell us what the key value is. So if, for instance, um, I pass in input 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and it told me that the output was the value 1. Okay, if I provide the input 0, 0, 0, 0, and the output is value 1, then I can look at my S box and see that there are four possible values for the key. Okay, and we know that because um, there's four values that will return 1. If I then reset the circuit, and provide the input 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, it will again return me four possible values. But I already did this once, remember? So if I've changed my input and I now have uh, four possible values being returned again, I can look to see which values are the same. So if I, re if I actually got zero, uh, if I got the value eight and I know that the possible values here are here, then that means that for value one, for the answer one I got before, the possible key values are here. If I put in this value, I get the value eight, the possible key values are here. There are two possible keys now that are the same. The top row here, 00110, and the bottom one, 101101. And that's present in both of these sets. But the middle two values, they're different. So I can rule them out because the key has stayed the same. So now I provide my third specially crafted input. I get the value 14 in response. Once again, 14 has four possible key values, but only one of those key values would have given me the two answers I've seen earlier. So now it's 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and we've successfully worked out what the key is. Okay, and so we can run that. So here's some code that performs this analysis for us. I'm going to run that, and it says here. So this is the example that I just said in the code. So we, we pass in the input 0, 0, 0, 0, and we say that we got the response um, so one, so that's the response one, and it says here are the possible key values, which are the same ones from the figure. Uh, and we can see here that 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0 is present in all three of these. Um, so that would be the only reasonable um, key value, meaning that our secret key in this case um, is that value. So that's great. So we can actually construct similar patterns for all of the S boxes. And, and if you have a look, you can go to Wikipedia here. Um, Wikipedia has got all the values of the S boxes. I just showed you S box one, but every single S box is a little bit different. So we have to have a different formula for each of them. Um, these patterns can be combined to then determine the round key. So how do we do that? So first we need to come up with equations that actually reverse those um, other equations uh, that, that I showed. So um, equation 10 will let us determine what um, bits in the R value are that go to A and we need to know what point A is because it's the um, this is A is what's actually XORed with the key there. Uh, that then means that for our special magic values um, we can now determine um, equations what for what we need A to be. So I, uh, I, uh, my explanation in the text shows that we need 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, and then 1, 0, 0, 1, 0. That's for the first S box. And for the other S boxes, we have to construct these three column values as well. Um, one challenge is we can't just present the, the um, value at point A because we're not scanning in values. So then we need to also determine the relationship between A and the left and right registers, and then also undo the 
initial permutation. Um, eventually, once you work your way through that rearranging, you come up with three special inputs to the circuit. So these are no longer values at point A. These are the values that you're actually going to ask the, 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 the system to encrypt. OK, so and this is just all simple substitution and rearranging. So you can go through that if you're interested. I've still got 10 minutes, so that's good. OK, so where are we? We've got three special inputs, all zeros, all zeros with a couple of A's and then some zeros with eights, twos and A's. And OK, and these are in these are in locations determined by these equations. What we're going to do is request that the um, uh, first, we're just going to do a sanity check to make sure that these uh, values that we've determined are correct. We're going to run these and then scan out the registers just to make sure that they are uh, uh, correctly at point A so we can do that. Okay, and we can see here that these numbers are what we need them to be according to, to our attack. So that's good. We've successfully, all these equations are correct. So that's good. Um, now, we can't also directly observe the values at point D. So inverting the scan chain, we've said, is easy if we know this value here um, at point C, but we can't determine this, this value. Uh, there's no scan chain here. Instead, we're going to be scanning them out of R1. So we need to undo the E function and we need to uh, we need to undo this exclusive OR and we need to undo that permutation. Well, undoing the exclusive OR is fine because we control the L register. So we can just make it all be zeros. Um, and we uh, undo the, um, the permutation, which is just, a, 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 again, a simple rearranging. So we have another equation for that. Um, and so we can, again, check our work. Um, and now what we've got is the um, after the special inputs, we've got we can come up with the values at point C. So here are the outputs of those S boxes. So we came up with that function earlier that says if we've got the outputs of the S boxes and we know the inputs to the function F, now we can actually work out what the possible keys are. So I'm just calling that function we defined earlier and it says here, okay, so for given our special inputs, here's the possible S box values. Um, and now, because we've got three sets of inputs, we can just look for the common term in each of these values. So we can run that code. And now it says here, bits one to eight only have one possible key value, one possible key value. And so if we concatenate all of those together, that gives us the round key. Um, now, I, I, I say in the comments here, um, there should only be one possible round key, but the rest of my code's actually structured, assuming there isn't one possible round key, um, because we've still got a brute forcing step later on. Um, so if I actually go up here and I change my special key values, let's, uh, I'm going to just put in a, a change here. I'm going to put this, make this be one, and I'm going to rerun these boxes. What will happen is um, we're going to have a uh, some different values here and it'll say here possibly um oops so uh there's no possible values for that so so our attack doesn't work anymore okay uh so so this this input is no longer practical because it's not telling us that it can determine um the values based on those keys so you can also have a play around with the special values there these are not unique by the way there are other specially crafted inputs you can do that will give you the 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 unique keys as well Okay, so now we're back to where we were. Um, okay, to, yeah, and some inputs will actually give you multiple possible values depending on what you choose. Um, okay, so now we've got the um, the round key. Okay, so so what we're gonna do is, um, oops, there's a still something I've not copied correctly here. Um, um, as noted on uh, the line 23 of this, the, the round key can be determined just based on this. Okay, so what all we're doing here is we're just converting this um, this binary into the, the hexadecimal. That's all that means. There's only like three lines of code there. Okay, so we've got the round key now. So that's fantastic. Let's go back to our diagram. What have we determined? Okay, so the round key ROM, we know what the first round key here one is, R key one. But if we go back and we say we actually want the input key, well, round key one itself is some permutation of the rotated bits of the input key. Um, and round key one is only 48 bits of that input. OK, so 48 bits of the 56 bits of actual key value after that permutation. So how can we work out the remaining eight bits? So the third phase of this attack um, answers that question. So after we've determined one round key, we want to determine the remaining 56 bits of the key. Eight of the 64-bit key is technically are just parity bits. They're not 
there's no encryption based on them. So you can actually just reconstruct those directly by performing the parity algorithm. Um, after determining the round key, we have 48 bits of the key. And because PC2 and shifts and PC1 are all just straight through permutations, it's quite right, straightforward to, to, you know, to get back to those 48 bits of the key. So there's, there's uh, two different things we can do. Um, we can just actually do a similar attack on round keys R2 and R3. Um, by using the scan chain to scan in replacement values. Um, but I said in this attack, we actually weren't going to try and scan in any values. Instead, we're only scanning out values. Um, well, as it turns out, uh, there's only eight bits remaining of the key, right? That, that actually means there's only 256 possibilities. 256 possibilities is nothing when it comes to encryption. Um, so what we're instead going to do is we're actually just going to brute force the remaining 256 values. So the first step we need to do is actually just undo those permutations that we said. Um, so that's what this code here does. It, it just goes through and undoes the PC2 rotations and PC1 um, permutations to give us basically what it thinks the key can be. So this is what we know. So, so none here is a parity bit. And then for each of the bits in the key, um, it says if it knows it definitively. So it says one, zero, 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 zero. And then here it says zero or one. So round key one has not told us what this bit should be. Uh, and it also hasn't told us what this bit should be. So this, this list of possible values here um, can be, you can take the Cartesian coordinate, uh, sorry, the Cartesian product of this, uh, and it'll give you the list of all possible keys. And we can ignore the nuns because as I said, they're parity bits. We don't need to calculate them. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to, um, for every possible key, in the list of possible keys, um, we're just going to instantiate a new set of DES hardware, which you know is forced to run that key, and then we're just going to run the the encryption over our test code and just check to see if the the cipher text matches. Um, we're going to do that brute force. Look at that; it takes like what, no no time at all. Um, and it says here uh, we're brute forcing 256 possible keys, and then we find the key eventually during that brute force attack. Um, and so as a result, we have now um successfully obtained the secret key used that was uh, used to generate the round keys that were in this ROM, uh, which means the entire DES is now um, broken using that scan attack. Uh, so I've got a couple of minutes left. Um, I'm, I'm happy to take any questions. Um, I, I went through this really quickly because I wasn't sure how long it would take. Um, hopefully you've taken the um, opportunity to open up this um, Google Colab. Feel free to play around with the code, try and understand how the code works. Um, you know, change the, see if you can come up with your own set of unique values. Um, the uh, All of the equations here are, um, are hopefully enough and an explanation here is what you can use to try and determine what you use to, to, to reverse those S boxes. And as I say, there's more than one possible value um, for the new publication. Uh, so, so we're, um, oops, there's a typo in the title. Uh, for the, the paper that we've written that, that's associated with this, pub, uh, with this tutorial, um, we came up with new values for this that hadn't been seen before. So, um, you know, the, you should be able to come up with other sets of inputs if you're interested in trying that out as well. Um, you know, and you may be able to come up with non-optimal inputs that give you um, some set of um, possible keys as well. Um, which can be kind of uh, interesting as well to say um, now, okay, so look at that. I came up with a new value that also uniquely identifies the keys. So um, yeah, so there's lots of different ways that you can try and play that. Um, yeah, so thank you for listening and um, I'm happy to take any questions now. Um, let me just go back to my last slide here. Um, so the concluding remarks. Uh, it's very important to be able to test your integrated circuits, um, but the way you define your tests, especially if you're using scan chains, may enable leakage of any secrets you might have in your devices. Uh, and, and your cryptographic hardware can contain embedded keys, um, and, and then therefore scan attacks on those uh, cryptographic hardware can leak those keys. Um, and today I've just shown you how you can do it on DES, um, but equivalent attacks can also be constructed for AES, which is the replacement um, algorithm, they're just a little bit trickier and much harder to go through in a, in a, in a short tutorial space. Um, so thank you very much for listening. And um, if we've got no questions, I'll just hand directly over to Ben, who's the next speaker.
uh, Hammond, do you want to? Did you share the? The Google, the, yes, the Google collabs in the Zoom chat. I know. Also, the original paper. So if they don't, uh, if they can read the mappings and so on. So. Yeah. Um, so yeah, actually, let me. Uh, Both of the papers, the new one and the old one. If, yeah, so I don't have the. Oops, my Zoom's crashed. I can't stop sharing. Did I have I stopped sharing? Oops. No, you're still. No, there. you haven't. Oh, you have. Okay. Um, I've just dropped into the Zoom chat, everyone, um, a link to a paper that uh, kind of nicely um, captures a lot of what Hammond presented, <clears throat> as well as some other additional material when it comes to uh, high-level approaches to hardware security. So do check that out um, in, uh, if you get a time, uh, a moment. So let me now uh, share my screen. And because I'm going to be drawing stuff on an iPad, I'm going to uh, turn off my camera so you don't just see the top of my forehead. OK. And I don't want this thing here. Let's see. I'm not quite sure why I'm, why I'm floating, but I am floating. So <clears throat> enjoy. Um, okay, so for this last section of um, today's uh, class, uh, we're going to focus on this idea of hardware security bugs. So it's going to be a little bit of a change of um, track yet, yet again from what you've already heard. But one of the things that I'm hoping you'll take away today is um, that this is a really kind of interesting, broad um, topic area that um, I encourage you all to uh, consider um, working in and helping us come up with new solutions to the various different challenges that uh, exist um, in design today. So let's have a very quick recap of uh, what we've heard so far in today's class. So in the beginning, we um, heard this wonderful thing from Ramesh about this idea of kind of third party uh, malicious things. Right, that you may be incorporating as a result of um, acquiring things from other vendors, or you know maybe some of this um, kind of vulnerabilities or um, security issues arise from the use of bad tools and, and so on. And we heard from Hammond um, just now uh, this idea of well, you've got um, some sort of uh, kind of legitimate. functionality that has a benign purpose that you add to a design that can then lead to security attacks in the field. Now, in each of these cases, what we have is in, in some sort of uh, bad intent, some sort of active attacker, some sort of malicious intention um, causing uh, you or us as uh, designers, as security um, kind of concerned um, engineers, um, a whole lot of stress. Now, to kind of finish off our little story here um, with today's class as an introduction, what I want to now talk about is the domain of unintentional, of unintended security weaknesses that can be introduced into a design and talk to you a little bit about what we can do in those cases, where these things come from, what the broad challenges are, and, and so on. And as with the other sections of the class, um, I am intending this to be somewhat interactive. So feel free to kind of jump in at any point in time, ask questions. Um, I'm slowly becoming more comfortable with the uncomfortable silences. So if I give you a moment to kind of think about what we're talking about, um, we'll take that moment. So the learning objectives for this um, part of the class, I've really kind of taken two uh, key things. The first really is this familiarity with the MITRE CWEs. Um, and this is a very uh, 
new, for hardware at least, database that is uh, very useful as a resource and I think should be engaged with more. Um, so for those of you that are students, those of you that are academics, um, this is a really fantastic resource that has come you know, with a lot of industry input that we can try and use in um, for the study, research, teaching, and so on. The second thing that we'll try and take away from today, or this part of the um, class at least, is uh, an understanding of some hardware security bug examples. And part of this, what I'm hoping we'll try and, and get across, is the idea of, of this kind of thought process that is required to try and deal with hardware security bugs in design. So let's start off with just a very broad overview of the general design flow for digital systems, and in particular these days, uh, system on chip designs. So uh, hopefully everyone is generally familiar with this process, but as a kind of refresher, Often what we do when we start uh, any sort of design process is this idea of design exploration. So we want to get an idea of uh, what sort of things our system should be able to do. We think about requirements, we talk to stakeholders, um, we think about the sorts of environments our designs might eventually be used in, and so on. Um, there are also, in broad strokes, a lot of different design options. And so we kind of want to explore, okay, do we have, um, uh, how do we make various different architectural decisions? Um, and in this early stage, you know, the kind of the sky's the limit. And we are in this process of constantly trying to refine um, our requirements so that we can try and work towards more concrete specifications that will lead us to implementation. Now, after we've got a broad understanding or broad ideas about how we might want to go uh, about doing uh, or implementing a design or designing something to achieve a variety of specifications, we go into this process of architectural planning. So now we start refining and thinking about, okay, what sort of big picture IPs might we, we want? What sort of big um, parts of the system do we want to integrate? So for instance, maybe we want to think about the number of processes, uh, the elements of say the cache design or cache hierarchy, the memory architectures, um, what other peripherals you want to add and so on. Once we've uh, kind of got an idea of, of what the architecture looks like, then we go into this notion of micro architectural design. So again, there's still a fairly high level of abstraction. We're now thinking a bit more about, you know, given it say a processor, uh, how do we want to implement, uh, you know, a given instruction set architecture? What sort of optimizations are we trying to do? Um, how do we try and coordinate the various different moving parts inside a design and so on? And as always, there's probably a little bit of a, a you know, kind of a, this sort of continuous iterating back and forth as we try and get these uh, designs more and more specified. Now, eventually, with once we have reached a point in our microarchitectural design where we think, okay, everything is going to be functional, we're going to meet most of our design objectives, we then move on to this uh, process of RTL implementation. So using the specifications of what the system should do, um, coming from the microarchitectural design, we now try and actually write RTL. And uh, I think everyone here probably has familiarity with uh, um, hardware and digital hardware design, but if not, just as a reminder, some of the languages that we like to use in uh, RTL implementation include things like System Verilog, VHDL, um, Verilog, um, and uh, you know, every um, couple of years, there's also some kind of new interesting um, alternatives that kind of appear, um, although commercial support for those languages kind of may vary. Now we implement the RTL, so we have you know, a whole lot of designers sitting down, uh, actually typing out Verilog code and so on. Um, and as part of that uh, process, we have to care about whether or not that RTL is in fact functionally correct. And so then we have this notion of verification. And so we kind of design something, we verify that we've done it correctly, maybe we find some functional bugs, say we try to implement uh, you know, some sort of 
uh, algorithm for cryptography, like what we heard um, often happens from you know Hammond and Ramesh. And maybe we find that it was a bug there because you know there is some control signal that doesn't work out functionally. You know, there are cases that break. So then we come back and we re-implement the RTL and we adjust it and so on. So we go through a little bit of a cycle here, particularly if you're trying to design systems in a more agile fashion. Now, verification itself, hopefully we all know, is, is quite a challenging problem, even just functional verification, because we always want to think about um, corner cases. We want to think about the range of inputs that are acquired. We want to worry about all the different ways um, we might want to use our given design. And not only that, we're always kind of in the pursuit of trying to optimize things, trying to make things better. And so verification as a general kind of uh, part of the design flow helps us make sure that, that uh, things are still in track. Now, once we've reached that point where we think we've covered most of the bugs that we care about and that we, or, you know, we've reached the, the deadlines, so to speak, if we're trying to ship a product out, we kind of move on to fabrication where we, you know, bundle up our design after it's gone through physical synthesis and floor planning and all of that wonderful stuff. And then we send the chip out for fab. And that in itself also involves a whole lot of different steps that I won't go into today. Um, but eventually you get your chip back, in which case you do some more testing and validation. If everything passes, you've got a good product, then you deploy it. And a lot of times, uh, once you've made a product, it's not simply you sell it, forget about it, but you also provide some level of technical support. So my first question to the class is this, at which point in this design flow could potential security issues be introduced? So here's what we can do, because I know not everyone is necessarily comfortable with unmuting. Um, I'm going to say, you know, give you a minute to type something in the chat window. Don't hit enter yet. And then after a minute, we're all going to press enter at the same time. And I'm going to see what kind of responses we get, right? So here we go. I'm going to, on my side, I'm going to start a timer for one minute. I want you to type where the answer to the question, where in the design flow can we introduce potential security weaknesses? So right, here's a minute. Just type it into the Zoom chat. Don't hit enter yet. We're all going to hit enter at the same time. So no one's going to get the first mover advantage necessarily. No, oh, somebody's already jumped the gun, giving away your answer. We've got microarchitecture design in the chat. All right, everyone else, type your answer, right? Try not to copy ones you've seen before unless you really agree. You've got about... 30 seconds, and then you can all hit enter at the same time so that you know no one feels clever or less clever. Although I see another answer has already ended up in the, the chat window there. Okay, 20 seconds, you know, have a think. Put it in there. Where can security issues come up? I'm not keeping track. 10 seconds. If you haven't already put your answer into the chat window, three two, one, and everyone hit enter. If you haven't hit enter already, there we go. We should have a nice waterfall of wonderful things coming through. And okay, so let's have a look through the chat together and see. So we've got microarchitectural design as a potential option. Uh, security issues can emerge at deployment. Uh, architectural planning, microarchitecture, design RT implementation. Okay, so we've got somebody that thinks quite a number of steps. Uh, somebody that said architectural planning, somebody said microarchitecture and RTL implementation. Uh, wonderful person has said anywhere, architectural planning all the way through to fabrication. And uh, somebody uh, else has said everywhere until fabrication. So what I'm going to say today as maybe a controversial statement, but maybe not, is that this entire design flow has opportunities for security issues to be introduced. And this is where we have to remind ourselves that security really is a system problem. It's a really a system level concern. Why? Well, because in design exploration, and when we're thinking about requirements specifications, it's always possible that we don't think about all the potential attacks that could happen. We don't necessarily um, uh, uh, completely define 
exactly who's going to be using our designs, what they might be using it for. We don't always understand, in fact, in the very early stages of a project, exactly what sort of assets we have in the system. Right? We don't know who the actors are. So when we start making these early design decisions, we don't always have the full picture. And at that point, things can kind of creep in. Similarly, with architecture planning and microarchitectural design, oftentimes we're thinking about very traditional elements of uh, digital system design optimization. One of the things that we care about, we often care about things like area, we care about performance, we care about power, and these things are typically driving our um, fulfillment of our understanding of design requirements and so on. And so if we now start thinking only of area performance and power, that's where potential security issues can come in. Similarly with RTL implementation, one of the things that we'll talk about quite a bit today where security issues could arise is when we make mistakes, right? We are after all human. And so when I talk about mistakes, I include things as simple as typos through to even uh, perhaps more complicated logical errors. Now in verification, as I mentioned, that is also a very challenging problem just for functionality, but where could a security issue come up? What if we don't do a full check of security problems in verification stage? Now there's a big question. What does it actually mean to check for security problems in the verification stage? Well, maybe we'll talk about that a little bit today. Now it's interesting, a lot of uh, people have talked about, well, everything is potentially bad or potentially risky when it comes to security in terms of introducing things into the design all the way up to and including fabrication. However, one of the things that I will draw your attention to for those of you that are not as familiar with security is that fabrication and the foundry and the foundry level is considered to be a very popular concern in hardware security. And so I encourage you all, it's outside the scope of um, this kind of section of today's class, but go and have a look in your own time at this notion of IC supply chain security. Because it's during fabrication where we often talk about potential risks from things like hardware trojan insertion, reverse engineering, um, IP theft, all happening during that fabrication process or at that fabrication stage. And these things are in fact security concerns and can have direct impact on our design. Similarly, personal contestant and validation could also have potential security threats to your design in terms of how comprehensive those tests are and how comprehensive your validation is after the fact. And deployment and support. So one of the things that we often forget in digital hardware design is we think, right, after you've made something, it's fine. You send it out there, problem solved. However, one of the big issues when it comes to deployment and support uh, and, and making sure that our designs are secure throughout the entire lifetime is the idea that we actually have the ability to deal with security issues when they become discovered. Because I'm going to make another bold claim and say nothing that we do is perfect. And so inevitably, we will have security issues arrive and become discovered in deployment. And for something to be truly secure, we really need to find ways to say patch those problems or deal with those problems after we've actually sold a product or deployed it. If we don't, then we can say, well, we're actually introducing yet another security problem in the design uh, overall. So now, partly by kind of by design, this slide looks like a mess, right? The design flow looks a little bit like a, a real hodgepodge of potential security problems. And I've tried to emphasize this by my deliberately um, vague handwriting. But take this as a snapshot, right? There's lots of problems for us to be working on, lots of places in the design flow that we care about when we wanna try and deal with security issues. So in this part of the class, we're gonna to have to play a little bit of a detective role. So I'm going to, make you all imagine that you are kind of security, um, if you like, kind of security um, validation 
or security checkers or security kind of helpers in the design in the design flow, right? Maybe you're not entirely expert just yet in terms of helping understand security issues, but too bad. I'm giving you the job to think about security anyway as we go through uh, design um, and worry about designs. So your first job, right, is I give you a bit of Verilog code and I say, hey, is there anything wrong with this from a security perspective? Right. So today I'm going to focus on this idea of we're at RTL. Can anyone tell me if anything that's wrong? And again, I'm keeping an eye on the chat window. Also happy to have you um, kind of yell out. Now, I've given you a hint on the slide, but just take a few seconds to have a look. Anyone want to tell me if there's any potential problems here? And again, I'm throwing you in the deep end. I'm not giving you any context. I'm not giving you really much information, just a code snippet. Well, okay. Chat window seems a little quiet. So then I'll give you a little bit of extra context here. Reg lock is uh, short for a kind of register lock, okay. Do you see any potential issues now? So we've got uh, somebody still trying to figure it out. Somebody saying there's potentially a side channel attack by an analyzing reg. Uh, okay, so it's not reg clock. So this is not a clock. Um, this is a register lock. And yeah, I mean, you can say side channel, it's a bit broad, a bit general. I think there's something a bit more wrong inside this Verilog snippet. Well, something that we should be worried about or concerned. Aha, uh -huh. excellent. So now we're seeing a couple more things in the chat and we want to thank Dr. Pierce for helping us along as well. But let's start with uh, the most recent thing, RegLock2 is in use. That's true. So we've got here RegLock2, RegLock control 2 is not used. So the question is, is this fine? Is this not? Why is RegLock2 not used? 3 is being used, but 2 isn't. So this is a very valid question. Um, it's a valid concern. Has this implementation been done properly? See, when I look at the highlighted thing, you can see that this reg lock control one, right? The signal, whatever it is, seems to be used many times, but reg lock three is not. Now my little red box here was also a bit of a red herring because Dr. Pierce has very helpfully found that there is something interesting going here. We take the value of reg lock mem, three and we load it into reglock mem2 provided this control signal is is you know enabled similarly reglock3 mem sorry reglock mem3 also takes the value of reglock mem3 provided the signal is uh, available uh oh something is again a little bit fishy here is this really what we intended so now if i give you a bit more context and say okay perhaps the regist this reglock mem signal would it contain say access policy bits or something like that suddenly we say hang on it looks like what probably is a very major typo if each of these would say correspond to a different region of memory that we wanted to protect suddenly we are misconfiguring we're putting the wrong values of these access policy bits into these memory locations. So in theory, you could have an adversary come through. Maybe somehow they're able to directly configure RegLock Mem3. And then we'll find that you know somehow that same configuration goes into Mem2. 
So this is really kind of weird. How are we supposed to know? How are we supposed to find this? Well, we need to slowly build this notion of context. We need to get an idea of what's going on. But the fact that these sorts of bugs, um, you know, these sorts of typos are not beyond the realm of possibility, um, you know, should give us a little bit of concern, particularly if we work with people or teach people who write any sort of Verilog, system Verilog, VHDL. Um, I'm just keeping an eye on the clock, and I know this class finishes in a couple of minutes, so I'm just going to put this uh, kind of uh, try and wrap up um, fairly soon. But one of the things that I'll put here is yet another example, right? Let's say we have a potential uh, VHD implementation here, and we know we're trying to be clever, right? We're trying to add security features. We have some sort of grant access signal. Can anyone quickly spot a potential issue with regards to how we've done this grant access signal here? So this is very much a kind of Verilog specific thing. All right, so the logic is I, ch you know, check to see if my user ID is correct. And if so, then I put that signal into grant access and then I'm gonna let data come out if that ground access signal is in fact high, right, then I can actually, you know, change the, change my data. Right? I can send this new value of data in to data out. Totally fine, right? So I'm going to put, call Hammond on the spot here. Am I using a blocking or non-blocking assignments, Hammond? These look like non-blocking assignments to me, but also blocking under, well, there's a blocking under reset and then a non-blocking for the other two. Exactly. So, okay. First of all, bad Verilog, we're being inconsistent. And Hammond, who's, I'm going to say, I think his Verilog's better than mine, is right here. We've got non-blocking assignments. So that means that this check will be assigned to grant access, but will only actually appear on grant access on the next cycle, right? At the end of this procedure. And so this check is going to be out of date, right? This this check to, to protect data out is going to be out of sync with when grant access is actually evaluated. And on the next time, you know, on the next clock, let's say there is a new request and the user ID doesn't match, well, because we're using the previous value of grant access, if you like, in this process execution, um, you know, it's, uh, you're going to have a, a hard time. Now, Hammond on a nice sidebar has actually said there's yet another typo inside this Verilog code, and that is grant access is declared here as a wire, which is, of course, not going to be synthesizable because we're trying to use it as a sec essentially a reg inside this, uh, inside this always block. So really, that should be of type reg. OK, so Verilog and doing this kind of analysis, manual code analysis, it's hard. Right, you need to have so much background information of what's going on, and you need to care about so many different things. So why do we wanna worry about this stuff? Well, hopefully we can all understand the motivation of why we wanna check things earlier. Because as you go through the design flow, how expensive it is to fix things really starts to, to kind of grow very fast. Now, if we try and deal with security only towards the end, you know, after we've designed everything, after we've built it and out in the field, what kind of fix can we have if we haven't really thought about things? Well, the only fix is probably going to be take the device back, right? Do a big, massive recall. And that's just going to be far too expensive to do that fix. Because if you try and do a full hardware recall, you're going to be um, having a huge cost to get chips back. You're going to have a huge cost to your reputation and so on. So the earlier we think about security, the earlier that we try and help designers as they go, the better the posture that we have. So how can we avoid bugs? Well, somehow we need to be security aware, right? And as we've said, that's no easy task. And then we need to somehow do security checks earlier.
So one of the things that came up very recently is this hardware CW, the Hardware Common Weakness Enumerations, which is a database that is hosted by the MITRE Corporation that starts to collect lots and lots of different potential security weaknesses or design patterns that can lead to potential security flaws in a design. And this thing came out only very recently, I think towards the end of 2021. And so if you haven't seen this before, please go and check it out. Now, the CWEs for software have existed for a long time. And it's uh, built up this very well-known um, kind of way of discussing different security bugs um, and to categorize and taxonomize designs or snippets of designs that have these potential weaknesses. Now, uh, at the end of, sorry, so I think it came out at the end of 2020, sometime towards the end of 2021, um, industry groups got together, they did surveys, and they came up with a list of the most important hardware weaknesses. Um, again, available at this uh, website uh, URL up here. And you can see that there are a lot of things related to debug interfaces, access control issues, lock bit modifications, and so on. And so now we can say, right, if we're doing any sort of designs, clearly we want to add some security features. But if we don't do it properly, we can end up with security problems. So the CREs kind of look something like this, where they, you know, there are these different kind of titles and uh, naming code for each of the CWE. And you can see that they are accompanied by a short description, an extended description. And a lot of the times these security um, you know, weaknesses are explained in very kind of plain, broad terms because they're a very general, sort of generic kind of uh, taxonomy. And so I think we're running out of time for the class here today. So what I'm gonna say is, look, go ahead and try it yourself. Think a little bit about what sort of characteristics of different CWEs when it comes to hardware are presented. See if those CWE listings have any examples. And more importantly, think about what's missing when it comes to CWEs. Now, with the time that we have here, I think I'll just kind of scrub through. I had a, a lot more hands-on kind of blank slides, but um, here is a kind of set of challenges when it comes to thinking about interacting with the CWE lists and trying to come up with ways to find hardware security bugs. So just take that in for a moment. Fundamentally, we're not all security experts, which is why we're all learning. And I would say, you know, even me presenting this class, learning as well. And so thinking about and engaging with the hardware CWE list and thinking about these bugs, even in the Verilog level, I think is a really worthy thing um, for you to think about in your research, in your teaching, and so on. Um, now, I guess to kind of wrap up, um, I encourage you to uh, consider uh, checking out Trust Hub, which is a fabulous resource that um, Ramesh is one of the um, coordinators of that provides lots of things related to hardware security, from hardware trojans to hardware bugs, hardware security properties, and so on. If you're interested in hardware bugs, there's a wonderful set of competitions called the Hackat events, like Hackat DAC, Hackat SEC, um, which is really wonderful. Please reach out to me if you've got any questions, especially when it comes to the hardware bugs. Um, as I said, there's some papers related to this class that you should definitely check out, um, including the second paper here, which is specifically more about trying to detect those hardware security bugs. Um, I also just want to acknowledge on behalf of the team, um, some of the people that support our research work, including the National Science Foundation, the National, uh, the Natural Sciences and Engineering Research Council of Canada, and Intel Corporation. Um, so yeah, um, on behalf of uh, myself, Hammond and Ramesh, thank you all for coming to this class. I don't know how much overhang time we have, but I have gone two minutes over. Um, please do reach out if you're interested in talking about any of these things anymore. Um, and uh, yeah, thanks for attending and enjoy the rest of ES week. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Ben. Looks like everyone's dropping out now. So thanks, everyone. All right. Well, bye.
Bye all. Bye. Yes, thank you very much. And uh, we will end at this time point. Bye. Thank you. Mm -hmm.